Please join me in a warm welcome for author Nathan Englander and moderator Zach Bodner. I'm Zach, that's Nathan, in case you were wondering. So, um, before we get started, I thought I'd ask uh, Nathan to read a little bit from his latest book. It's a great honor to have him here. We're going to jump in. We're going to spend some time talking about his latest book, a little bit about your background, who you are, how you got to where you are, and yeah. we'll open it up for questions as well. But I thought we might want to awesome. hear from you. I'm already nervous. He's a ringer. I was like, those are all my subjects in his bio. <laughs> there you so go. I'm not going to get away with much. So uh, It's nice to be back here. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, it's my fourth book. Uh, we all, there's only one direction to go. Anyway, my first tour with reading glasses. Ah. So, I have a prop. <laughs> <laughs> Also, no one, it really is true. This is like my, I've been wearing them for like six months. This is my 38th pair. So, <laughs> you know, I watched my mom lose them, and now I'm losing my reading glasses everywhere. I'm going to keep this one. Yeah, I'll just read for like, wow, is this too loud for everyone? No? All right. It's crazy loud for me. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to read just for like Geneva Convention, like four minutes so you can hear Perfect. my voice. I'll just read the first couple of pages. Uh, by the way, this book, uh, God bless my sweet editor, this is the worst book to write jacket copy for. There's like literally, I mean, it sounds only like a telenovela. You're like, the general's in a coma. You know, anyway, but uh, yeah, I'm going to read the first three pages, which won't make any sense to the reader until like you're on a page 186. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, 2014 Gaza border Israeli side. It's never about you, neither attack nor counterattack. Not the three boys kidnapped, surely dead, or the child murdered in the forest, burned alive. Sitting still in a chair outside your rented cottage, you wait for the click of your tea water come to boil. You shift a foot, and at sight of you, a lizard turns the color of the sand. Across the country, the soldiers scrabble through the South Hebron hills. They crawl about, hunting the bodies, turning stones. And here, beyond the fences, the Gazans strip the markets bare. Dutifully, they run their taps, filling bucket and bowl. It is light still, bright still. And you know with the dark, the missiles will scream out from the olive groves and the rooftop lines, from the hospital parking lots and the pickup truck beds. The people along the coast will move into secure spaces in cities ever northward, mirroring the missiles' reach. And you, you will stay in your chair and sip your tea and watch the arc of the fiery tails as they curl overhead. Then will come the sirens and the burst and spark of countermeasure when the batteries hit their mark. So close is your roost that your only worry is ineptitude if the fighters on either side fire short. This rattle and boom is as of yet nothing but the sound of the two nations ramping up to the inevitable war. This time, as with every time, when the fighting starts, it will be more terrible than the fight that came before. Always it is the worst, the most violent, the least restrained, a steady escalation, the singular rule. And once the invasion begins, there's no knowing how and when or even if the bloodshed will ever end, only that both sides will battle for justice, killing each other in the name of those freshly killed, honoring the men who died avenging those who before them died avenging. Because of all this, you understand that your own thoughts are unseemly, your concerns outweighed and of no matter. Is it your boy gone missing? Is it your son burned alive? No, no, it's not. And unless that's your soldier son sleeping alongside his tank at the border, your mass fighter, outgunned and unprotected manning the Qassams that whistle through the night, then we expect you will not wallow and will not mourn. You are to take your daily disappointments, your unmet expectations and private catastrophes, and know that they are worthy of shame. Of course, you do know this and have accepted it. At least this is what you tell yourself as a bird you cannot name swings low by your ear. It ends its glide and then pumps its wings. In the silence that that bird breaks, you hear the sound of feather moving against feather during flight, a wonder. You turn your head to follow its path, shielding your eyes from the sun. Sitting there by your tiny cottage, you squint and consider your own astonishing stupidity, your brutal obstinacy, your resistance to giving up your own unique and abiding want. 
as the water gives off its audible royal and the kettle makes its click. You get up, telling yourself, you do not matter. Let it, let him finally go. But the imperative does not stick, and it seems that you will forge ahead with your truly hopeless undertaking until the right moment arises, until you get your lover's secret signal. You will, in the face of the endless menacing unknowns, hold fast. And to that inventory of silent surrender that this, that any war demands, you've decided there is one loss for you too large, a sacrifice you find yourself unwilling to make. It's a personal privation you can't stomach and will no longer accept. Let the soldiers soldier on and the civilians bear their burdens. But for you, you simply won't have it. You will not brook your broken heart. Thanks. <clears throat> wow. I'm glad you, you did that. You know, I wasn't sure if you were going to read with a voice like the yeshiva bucher or yeah. the guy who's doing the spoken word poetry slam thing. And it's, it's more the latter than the I former. I can do both. I, I'm sure I, you I can. I play the room. Yes. <laughs> so it's, first of all, it's an honor to sit with you. I've been a fan Thanks. of yours since For the Relief of Unbearable Urges. And um, I think we're sitting in the presence of the next Philip Roth or Saul Bellow. I feel like Years. you are one of the great Jewish writers of our generation. I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but I know you grew up with a Jewish mother, so I can't really yeah, compete with that anyway. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I, right. I get that much expectation before breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So you're in good company here. Yeah. A lot of Jewish mothers in the audience. Yeah. Um, so I was going to start somewhere else, but after having heard you read the first chapter, who's the you? Who, who is the you in that chapter? Well, it, un, it unfolds. Uh, yeah, now you're getting to... So uh, back to playing the room. I know where I am. But uh, there's a Hebrew concept, an Israeli concept, hafuch alafuch, which is the opposite of the opposite. And so everybody in this book pretty much is a double. Every pairing is a doubling. You know, we can talk about there's this, you know, the general and his coma and his caretaker and prisoner Z and his guard. And yes, so the you becomes who she becomes, and then who she becomes after that. But also back to that, it's only, you know, it's my fourth book, and uh, unlike gymnastics, like, I, what I love about the writing life, I have a lot of friends, the nice thing, it's, it's a really friendly time for writers around the world. I have to say, like, those old days of the fights, like, maybe there's some fights going on, it's really supportive. <laughs> but, you know, I have writer friends who are, you know, younger now, there's so many, my definition of younger, young writer has expanded <laughs> right, exactly. exponentially. My play, the 20s, I had a play five years ago, and it was about this young writer with these old writers, and when I wrote it, he was probably 19. When we cast it, I was like, he's about 38, 40. You know, like, that was right. starting his career. Oh, but anyway, when I, like, I have friends in there, you know, mid-80s and stuff, those writers, and they're still so vibrant and electric. And I was like, what I like about this sport is you can do it forever as long as you keep your marbles, you know. So yeah, every book feels like the first book. Every book, you know, it's with dead sincerity that I say, like, this is my most vulnerable, most naked, most raw. Like, that's what it is to me. I mean, I believe it is, but we can also talk about multiple realities in this, you know, right. in, this, in this book. But as to that, you just, you know, you learn... You get the muscle. I always talk about like cubism and Picasso. Like you go see early Picasso and he's the maestro, literally. Like before you're going to put two eyes on one side of the face, you got to be able to paint like a tree, right. you know? Anyway, but at this point, yeah, there's only three pages of second person in this book and there's like right. one paragraph of first person like 300 pages in. Like you just start, I feel ready to do crazy things and back to the circles on the cover of this book, there's maybe seven different timelines and you know, five different stories running. It's it's insanely structured, and that was, you know, we can talk about that, but that's, the conflict is insane, and I thought the book should be structured. Yeah, I want to get there. Match. It was really amazing how you structured it, but but I want to start at the beginning. What was the impetus for this book? This is unlike any book you've written so far, so what, yeah. where did this start from? Yeah, I've been carrying it, like I'm a, uh, this is where I drop the whiteboard behind us, but I'm a big believer, you know, I I sit alone in a room all day, you know, back to why I teach, you know, being at NYU is like having to put to words things that, you know, you're expert in these things outside of language. It's nice to say like, oh, this is how the brain works, but I'm such a believer in, in the subconscious and how writing forms and how ideas form. But yeah, I lived, I moved to Israel for the peace process in 1996 and, you know, moved back to the States heartbroken in 2001 when it was just clear to me that it was just that we burned the whole thing down, you know, and you know, of the things I wanted to be wrong on, you know, uh, there's, you know, this year I have my own American things I would have liked to be, you know, wrong on. Anyway, but, uh, 
Yeah, I just, you know, I wish I had come back and peace broke out. But yeah, it was just clear to me that they were torpedoing this thing for 20, you know, or getting on 20 years, 17 years. I've wanted to tell this story of that peace process coming apart because it broke my heart. And I also, the further we get away from it, the more impossible it becomes, the more I embrace the notion of peace, the more I believe in the impossible because I don't know what the other option is. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I take no positions in this book. I worked really hard. To me, I'm really interested. As If you sit up here as a writer, you've probably been saved by books. And how books saved me when I had questions was not, not the books with answers. It was books by writers who would wrestle with those questions. And this is the most loaded subject, you know, really that I can, you know, you know, there's a few on the list. We're dealing with guns today, but where people are entrenched and have, you know, there are two opposing realities. And yeah, I just wanted to build a book, you know, reading is a shared consciousness. I write this book as a, let's just talk as a reader. Like I write a, when I pick up a book, a writer's written it and that space disappears and it's a shared experience with author. I just wanted people to enter into this conversation, you know, to explore the subject, to bring themselves to it. Almost like in the last book, I had a story in my collection, which I talked about here, uh, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, there was a story called Sister Hill, Hills, which I built this story as an exploration of the occupation. I'm interested in how we use contracts, how we use justice, how we use absolutes. I did not want so many easy examples at the ready in this country, but if monuments need to be protected, even monuments to slavery and oppression and trying to break black people and in, you know enslavement and ownership, if these horrible monuments need to stand because monuments can't be removed, how come our national park monuments can be defiled and drilled in? Like, you can take whatever positions you want. You can't tell me those agree. Like, you can't undo a park monument because that doesn't matter, but then a monument to slavery, that is, you know, illogical. That obsesses me, those kind of, the way we make, you know, the way the Bible gets used, you know, these things obsess me. I wrote this story about the occupation, and when I put it out in the world, I'm so thankful to readers, really. Thank you for coming out tonight when we just do everything on our phones. <laughs> but, um, you know, it just functioned like a Rorschach test to me. It was, you know, I had this very strange experience where people would come up to me and they'd say, it's a right-wing story or it's a left-wing story, or because I have a lot of Jewish readers, they'd say, I'm right-wing, it's a left-wing story, what's wrong with you? Or I'm left-wing, it's a right-wing story, what's wrong with you? Nonetheless, everyone brought themselves to it, and I thought, I want to build a book that way, and, and that was my main, you know, structural goal for this book. The only thing that I've noticed on the road, because I'm talking to people now, the only stance in the book is that I believe in peace, but that's, I've decided like two plus two equals four, that there is no other stance but believing in peace. Like the idea that you'd say, we're gonna have psych, don't understand how that's a position, or that let's stick it out till somebody wins. Does anyone in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict wanna just take a step and envision what one side winning or the other side winning means when there's two peoples there? We've been through that as Jews before. You know, we don't wanna be on this side of erasing a people, and we don't want to lose, you know, you lose either way as a race or a racer, which is part of this book. So yeah, the only stand I do take in this book is peace, but it's not a stand. Right. It's the only, not killing each other is a, you know, again, in America today, I say there is no position that we should take anywhere in the world except let's not kill each other. Yeah, I have to say, you, you, you... <laughs> let's not kill each other. There's the title of your next short story. Yeah. I I have to say, I was one of those readers. When I picked this up the first time, as a strong Zionist, I had my antenna up, and I said, uh-oh, how's this going to be? I love this author. Is he going to make me change the way I think of him because I'm a strong Zionist, and what's he going to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And, um, and you cut through all that because you handled the complexity of it so well, and, and, you, and you did make us walk away thinking the only the thing that most matters is the, is the peace and the peace process and peace between these peoples. And yet you knew it was a minefield stepping in it. You knew you could have gotten a leg blown off I, I, I expect that it will, you know, that I'll get to that too, you know, but I mean, but that's the point. You write something and you write it from the heart. I was just looking at like John Gardner's on moral fiction, like the idea, uh, which I love that book. I was trying to think of, you know, I, I studied with Marilyn Robinson, people that have shaped me and back to books, you know, the people I didn't get to meet John Gardner. I showed up at university, he was already dead, but I was happy to be where his ghost was. But he was saying, like, a chemist in a laboratory runs an experiment. Like, when you're writing fiction, like, I really do believe in a moral fiction and that, you know, cert, you know that you can, you know, run these realities that you, and again, science is, you know, is sterile. 
a book better not be, a sterile book is not a living book. But yeah, I feel like to some degree, like you should be able to, like that's what books do is let us explore. That's why they're subversive. That's why, you know, a writer can't get a cab half the time in his or her lifetime. But when there's a despot, they come after the writers. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, because it really is a subversive form that lets you experience, you know, other, re- I always think about it, uh, Rabi, Rabia al Madina, Lebanese writer who lives in San Francisco, but he, you know, was here with me last time. But I remember when I was living there in Jerusalem, like we were at war, you know, with, you know, Lebanon at war. You know what I'm saying? Full war. Right. And he wrote his book, like I love his book, Kool Aid's, like this is before I met him, you know, or maybe around that time, like, I read this book and I love this book and I was sitting there in Jerusalem and reading about Beirut, I'd be like, they're exactly like we are. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's why it's subversive. Like, I can't go there, I can't visit, I can't see it, it's war. But I get this book and say, oh, those people are exactly the same as we are in Jerusalem. And I gave it to my French friend, you know, who's Baal Tshuva, religious guy, and he gave it, like, something like this woman who's like this great Torah thinker, like I hear, like, she's read it and I, like, love, you know, I was tracing this one copy of a book moving around Jerusalem that you could share these ideas. But yeah, yeah, after its publication, you have to stand by it, and who knows? You can't control how a book's read, but that's why I test my readers before, you know, like I get reads. I give it to my sister who wears a shaitel, and I give it to, you know, you know, a different Lebanese friend, or, you know, I give part, you know, like check this part, you know, to this friend, and, you know, and honestly, the hardest part of this book for me to research was, you know, not Arab, Israeli, or anything like that, is there's a lot of sailing in here, and I've, I haven't even <laughs> been on the Staten Island Ferry, but, sa- you know, if yeah, there are any sailors in here, they're crazy, and they'll be like, you can't reach the tiller arm from the jib, you know, so. You that, sound like an expert to me, and yeah, I don't know anything but, about Well, it's, it's clean now, but I really, man, the sailors gave me the business. I had the most notes from my sailors. Well, I actually wanted to ask about the, the research that went into this. I know that Prisoner X was, in some ways, a muse for your Prisoner Z, and there's a great line that you have in your interview at the, in the New York Times. You said they didn't know Prisoner X was alive until they found him dead. How much research did you do into the whole Prisoner X story and how much of it came out of your imagination? Yeah, this is, uh, and back to being raised religious, I never understand when people say like, oh, that comedian steals jokes. I am so trained. Like I can't, I'm going to use an E.L. Doctorow, you know, paraphrase, but I was like, I have to say like, I heard it from Darren Strauss who studied with E.L. Doctorow. I won't even go that far, but right. yeah. Uh, but yeah, E.L. Doctorow says, do like the minimal amount of research you need to write your book. And it's really an interesting notion, which is, I, I'm a huge believer, like you may not, the example I can give is from my first book, there's a story called The Tumblers, uh, about these, it's an allegory, you know, and you can see the own thread of your own work to build, this book ends up being a crazy allegory, but I had these Hasidim, it's the, you know, from Chelm, an allegorical Hasidim from an allegorical place, who end up trying to save their lives, I have like the old, you know, you know, ancient rabbi has only been sitting in his chair, like, do this acrobatic move to save his life. So I ruined that story for you. There's, <laughs> there's eight others. Anyway, but the point is, that was when I, like, you get your rules. I was, you know, a baby. I was 25 or something, but it was clear to me. I ended up making up the names. I took out, I had real names for the acrobatic moves, but I, I made up all the names because I thought someone like me, who's not an acrobat, could believe to save your life that you could do three backflips. But I thought someone who's a gymnast is going to say, you know, the guy's 86, he's been sitting in a chair his whole life, there's no way even to save his life that he can land, you know, tri- you know. Triple so it's my job to like make it so like everyone can, um, you know, imagine a story. So I really do believe a reality has to be real enough, you know, it, it better function. It's a different reality, but it's, it is no less a reality. That is, my, I, when I remember books, I, I don't remember words, I picture things. You know, that's how I wrote the title story of my last book. I was thinking, of, I was writing my story, and I had a memory of a Carver story, but I didn't remember the words, uh-huh. you know, what we talk about when we talk about love, love, his story. I just pictured, in my head, I saw two couples at a table. Like, good writing alters your, you know, you know, memories. So, yeah, back to that, I believe in the research deeply, and for my Argentina novel, you know, back to themes, which is about the disappeared and countries turning on themselves, and all these, you know, many, you know, different parts that, that echo these parts. I'd been to Argentina for a wedding. I probably spent, I mean, I spent a year in the New York Public Library and, you know, other years prior that just reading, I had to learn, you know, pop music of the time, alternative music of the time. Like I had to learn, you know, what kind of script you use for graffiti. I had to eat the foods. I knew how much topsoil they had, how many, like you have to have a brain. I had to be able to be an Argentine at the time. So for this book, the more I write, the closer, uh, 
I'm able to get to myself and do my writing. That is, I once said from the stage, uh, I was doing a, like a big, you know, like a big room, and I called myself shy. I was talking much like this, and someone screamed out, you're not shy. You know, <laughs> they got a good laugh, and I thought like, oh, I'm not shy, I'm private. And so for me, like my first story of dreaming of being a writer, I said in a Stalinist prison in 1952. For me to get raw and naked and close, like I had to go far to come close. And yet for this book, I thought, I want to write this book. Like this is, you know, I, you know, these are my places, like Jewish experience. Like I grew up with a biblical Israel my whole life. I lived there for many years. I watched the news for hours a day. I listened to it on the radio. I read the newspaper every day. I got a Judaic studies degree. Like I've studied the history. Like that's my place. And I, you know, uh, part of my NYU job, I've been teaching in Paris for a decade. It was not a hard negotiation. But nonetheless, like that's a city, you know, between book stuff, like that's a city I am. And my friend Jeff is here from Berlin. Like I lived in Berlin for four or five months and go back, you know, quite often. So I was like, oh, I'm going to use my own mental space for this. And right. yeah, so it was really built out of how about memory. How about the, the, the spy parts of the book, like the ability to kind of delve into how spies work. Did you have to vet that with anyone? You talk to anybody? In oh, so that's community? where, no, that's where, first of all, once you put spies in the field, like things change. But, uh, oh yeah, yeah, back to the actual prisoner expert. And by the way, I keep talking about what a rotten neurotic spy I would be and how I drew up that <laughs> to do that. And my buddy Sam is really convinced he thinks I'm a spy now. He's like, there's no better, I'm going to a city every day. I'm traveling all over the world for this, but he's like, that's the best cover is to go around saying exactly. what a rotten spy you would be. So right. now my, he's really convinced I'm under deep, deep meta cover. Right. But uh, yeah, it was my last book tour. I was on the way to the airport on the front of page of the newspaper on Haaretz, my paper of note over there that I love, was this story of Prisoner X, who, as you said, which caught my eye. You know, And again, writers are terrible people in many ways. But in some ways where somebody's like, oh, I've had a terrible tragedy. I'm like, how many minutes till you cried? What'd your mother do? You know, we're always like, data, data. So yes, a life was lost here, and it's sad, and I don't know anything about it because a lot of it's secret. But this prisoner disappeared into the Israeli system. Like, prisoner X, he hung himself in his cell. Until, the, he, had, until he died, he had not existed because he was disappeared. Like, there was no X. Until there, there was a dead X. There was no live X. And until the moment of hanging, like, he hung himself from the cell, there was nowhere from, you know, whence to hang himself until the moment of hanging. No X, no cell, and upon hanging and death, there's a, you know, a body. There was a cell, and then there was a person. And I got very interested in it. But what I really got interested in, back to dreaming of writing this book, you know, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I use Marilyn Robinson as an example, where there's probably like 18 years between housekeeping and Gilead. She wasn't writing Gilead for 18 years. She was figuring, you know, it was cooking, it simmers, and then when she figured the book, she wrote it in like 18 months. So I was waiting for almost 20 years to tell this story, really. But nobody needs a diatribe, nobody needs a lecture from me, nobody needs my peace talk, you know. I don't feel expert in anything, which prior to last year would be a reason not to weigh in, but now I could head NASA, and I'm definitely more qualified. You know, I could run the education department, like nothing. But anyway, but the point is now, that metaphor of, you know, not being an expert no longer holds. But nonetheless, I felt like nobody needs my long, passionate, heartbreak lecture on peace. Like, I, I have those pages. I can print them out for you. But nobody needs to see those, you know? So, yeah, when I heard about Prisoner X, he was a guy so much like me. Mm. You know, he was this, you know, I maybe got more biblical. He got more Zionism, you know, much like this stage. <laughs> but anyway, but he was Australian. You know, he was, he moved to Israel. I thought about that, like, Here's a guy who so believes in something, he moves to a foreign country. That's how ideological he is. It's a big deal. Like, he moves from Australia to Israel to adopt this country, and he's so diehard and so committed, he joins their super terrifying, like, vaunted spy service, and then goes, you know, he's not an analyst, then he's under, like, deep cover, and then he becomes a traitor. And we all know the reasons people become traitors. I love it. I love the real stories, you know, uh, I get to go to the spy museum in DC. I'm doing their spy podcast. I'm all oh, excited. Nice. I've never been. But I love the real stories and I also love the, you know, every movie, they have a every great book. gift shop, by the way. You should stop oh, yeah, the other exactly. way back. Yeah. I'll get I'll get there. Uh, I'll send you something. <laughs> but um but I was just always interested, like people, the reason they become traitors is like failures of character, like, you know, their own, you know, problems. They've been blackmailed, they've been passed over for a promotion, you know, like as we said, why they collude. You want to be president? There's so many reasons to like collude with a foreign power 
and be a spy. And I thought about it. I was like, what would it take? Like, here's a guy. He's literally, you know, like in the Mossad under cover and flips. I thought, what would it be to flip for empathy? Like, what would it take to flip someone out of feeling? Mm. And when I had that thought, I was like, now I have my book. Like, I was like, I just want to write and flip someone that committed, like, because of their heart. You, you did an incredible job, and yet you never share what the traitor move was. You, you know, we, we know that this, this character has been flipped, and we know um, that there was a moment, but you never in the book talk about what, what the act was of traitorship. Yes. Why'd you do that? Why'd you choose not to? Oh, I love it? negative. I just believe in negative uh, space. Yeah. I was like, do not talk about negative space for nine hours. That's my <laughs> own. That pause was not loss of train. It was the gates Don't do going it. Don't up. do it. Don't, Don't do talk it. about negative space comes. for nine hours. Yeah, stop. Oh, yeah. You're building a, you're, when you're building a world, like a complete universe, like here's the whole point. All of us in this room together, it's infinite. Like what it took to put all of us in this room and I get moved every night. It's just the fact that we're all here, all speaking the same language, all in this place. There's infinite stories. Like what makes the two of us talking real is that we just met. Like we have enough about each other. Like if I knew every detail about you and you and me, that's like fa- that's not how. You know, sometimes I, I just love. I, I think a story has to have completion. You have to have every detail you're owed. You're not allowed to deny stuff to the reader. That's bad. Right. It better be complete. But sometimes people say like, "Well, who's guilty? Why did they do that?" You know, these moments. And I was like. You know, we can do it in here. Someone can scream it out. Your friends are getting divorced. Like, I don't know, the wife cheated, you know, the husband's this. And then, like, you know, everyone's always split. Like, you're on his side. She's on his side. Like, she was miserable. She should have cheated. Like, I feel bad for him. You know, like, that's how story works. We have, like, we take positions. We never have all the facts. And we always bring ourselves to the story. And that's part of that interaction. You know, I, I hope you get what you need, but right. like, yes, I don't need 10 chapters on the drop. Right. It's such a... Light- Back to it being, you know, as, I was all excited, you know, like as somebody like my agent sat me down with tea and she's like, you know, you've written a political thriller. Like for <laughs> me, you know, literally it's the first book. It's my fourth book. And I was like, I discovered plot the way someone has an epiphany, you know, like the guy, who, the woman who made up the Sestina, you know, I was like, right. what if someone were to read to find out what happened? You know, literally, I was like, <laughs> what if I have a book that's not about the music of language, you know? <laughs> so yeah, for me, the idea of dealing with a plot was, you know, insane making, but nonetheless, it's still a hyper, you know, in the end, it's also a magic realist history, and it's also right. a love story and also an allegory. So in terms of abiding by every rule of the political thriller. Right, or breaking I, I, every rule, I, right? Yeah, I and, left and out the dead drop. There's <laughs> no dead drop. For but you, you, this is why you've called it, I think, a turducken of a novel, yeah, right? Yes, yes, for yes. those of you who don't know what a turducken is, you had a turkey with a duck and a, and a chicken. And so, right, yeah. so, so you've also said this is a love story. Who's the love story between? Who's the love story to? Is this your love note to Israel or quite the opposite? I'm trying to yeah, figure yeah, out. It's, uh, yeah, there's a... A uh, love story between an, you know, an Israeli and a Palestinian who are involved in the peace process Yeah, in the book. But for me, that's of the metaphors and all the metaphors, like back to this title, one of the mysteries of this book as I, you know, friends are reading it, you'll be really far in and you'll be like, this title better pay off. It can't just be a random, <laughs> right, right, you're, right. you know, you're <laughs> literally, it's like. It does, it does end. pay off. Yeah, it's but the whole time I was like, that's that, that's the thriller part of this book. You're like, why this random title right. I was like, the whole time? Was that the dinner? Was that yeah. the dinner? Yeah. You know, right? Exactly. There's multiple moments. Yeah, there's that had to be food. the dinner, but no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got me. Well, I just, back to the things that I brought back from my time, like lessons learned from living in you know, Jerusalem all those years was, I was watching people, you know, in the peace process, it was really right there. I can't say enough. You know, when we, when you unravel history and you say like, oh, of course, this, you know, you can't, I have a game also in the book, but then I'll answer because, but a game that I have in this book is a, you know, when I talk about drawing on things from my own, own life, it's a game I played with my friend. We still play it, but I put it in this book where we say what regular people altered history. You know, like somebody shot Franz Fert, you get World War I. You know what I'm saying? Like Yigal Amir, you know, you're not a radical because you do something radical. Like Yigal Amir, the prime minister was not assassinated by a radical Israeli. That's the terrifying part. He was assassinated by a regular law student who went to a regular university in Bar Ilan. Like nobody fancy, nobody on a mountaintop with pay us to the floor. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's the point. Like people who change you know, history. And I think about that, like, you know, if the Supreme Court, if we didn't have, you know, that's the example, like hanging chads, like if 
if we didn't have an electoral system built to support slaveholding states, like, would we have these storms 20 years later if we had Al Gore? You can't, you know, reverse engineer, look what's happened to, like, things don't have to happen. And then after they happen, we say, oh, this is how history is. Like, it doesn't. We have human capital, we have voices, we have power, and we have to fight for things as our democracy is being, you know, dismantled. So I'm saying to you now, why I believe in hope more is I'm telling you, peace was right there. So you're saying how bad it is now and how absolutely truly just shitty the situation. There wasn't a wall when I lived there. You know, I can't believe I talk about the glory days, you know, when we were blowing each other up, but we at least, you know, with the same power structures and the same occupation, the same problems, like, we interacted. You know what I'm saying? Now someone, an Israeli or Palestinian, the age now that I was when I moved to Israel probably doesn't ever remember a time without a wall up. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to tell you, it felt so good when I was there. You right. Know we were there in a similar era. You were there a little bit before yeah, I was. Yeah. We both studied abroad at Hebrew U. We both remember Frank Sinatra cafeteria and the schnitzel and Nancy Reagan uh, Plaza. And it was, it was a different time. Yeah, it was yeah. a halcyon period of, of dreams yes. and hopes and the peace process. Yeah. But, but uh, to answer the question that you asked that I started a 20-minute preamble to <laughs> is just the lesson I learned about the peace process, which is the critical point that's the structure of this book, which is people are trying to broker a peace between two sides or people on the ends of a spectrum. It's not like you can believe in school vouchers and I can fiercely. I would not be here without state school. You know, your tax dollars are for that. Don't believe in them. That's two sides of an argument. Right. Like, it got clear to me that I was a Jew living in Jerusalem whose holy site was the Temple Mount, and my Palestinian neighbor, you know, she's living in El Quds, and her holy site is Haram al-Sharif. Like, we are in the same physical space, breathing the same air, but we were not in the same city. It's two separate realities, right. and we have that in America now, which we've never had before. Like, that's the point, where people are having different realities. We didn't have alternate realities before here. We had disagreements, you right. know? And to me, that's the core of this book and the answer to your question from like 7.15. <laughs> so speaking of, speaking of different realities, I want to shift to talking a little bit about you and growing up. And um, there's always a character that has an interesting relationship with a mother in many of your stories, in each of your novels. Um, and there's a great scene in this one where the mother has to make a phone call from the office of the CEO of the JCC, which yes. made me chuckle. Yeah. Um, but you obviously grew up in a very different world than you are now. You grew up Orthodox in Long Island, and now you're living as a secular Jew in, in Brooklyn. Tell us yeah. about your journey. How did you get there? Not just the Israel piece, but the whole upbringing and why you left the way you had grown up and where you are now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I like me, Mom. Oh, that spy stuff. I just thought about that. Back to thinking of myself as a spy and as an erotic. <laughs> I thought, like, my, you know, who would I caught this one, the spine needs to make, I was like, who would my important, you know, who would be my emergency contact be as a spy? I was like, still my mom. Your mom. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So right. I, I, I've been married for like five years now. I want you to know my, my wife is the contact number. I know that much. <laughs> she is to your, but, yeah, your uh, wife will be happy to hear that. Yes. But uh, uh, yeah, so no, I grew up, yeah, Orthodox in suburbia, and that comes into this book too. It was, uh, yeah, my roommate dragged me. Literally, I think on my mother's side, it's five generations. Like, we came and we stayed. I think I was the first person to leave the country since my great grandparents on one line. Wow. You know, first one with a passport. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I, uh, when I got, my roommate dragged me to, we, I was religious and miserable. And uh, my roommate dragged me to Jerusalem for junior year. He's like, you're asleep here. You can sleep in the dorm there. So <laughs> right. I went. And, uh, and yeah, the first week I got off the plane, I gave up Wow, orthodoxy. I'd never seen, you need to see something. Back to seeing, you know, and I, uh, like back to understanding, back to why cities function a certain way is because people mix. You need to see something. And I had never seen anything, like I wasn't happy in the, you know, religious world, but I hadn't seen anything that I could connect to that was a version of existence that I could understand, sure. you know? So seeing, like, I got off that plane and to see an atheist who's, like, speaking in Hebrew, who has the same references as me, who knows the same songs, who, like, has the same culture, I'd never seen, the, you know, we could bring, like, I really understand it. Back to separate realities, I love having this, you know, of the healthier things to discuss with my family. Like, there's no such thing as cultural Judaism. Judaism is a religion. How can you have a cultural Judaism? Like, it's a religion. It's a religion, so you do it, you are religious. That's how you are Jewish. Like, they did to say, like, I'm Jewish, but it's just a culture to me. It's not, it doesn't compute, you know what I'm saying? So for me, who was hungry for that, it was really, the, yeah, like the week I got off this plane, you know, even that notion where it'd be like, oh, this, you know, 
like this person's going to hell, this person's not a real right. Jew. Like it really didn't, it, it just filled everything in for me. And Sure, and, and I can that, imagine that. that was that. But I also think, sorry, yeah? No, no, go ahead. I, I was just going to also say, back to the things that get put on this book about place and space, you know, uh, distance, so that's the thing. A lot of things uh, that Dr. Friend I referenced before, he also taught me from science that I love, which is true, true, and unrelated, which I said, true, I was religious, true, I gave up religion in Israel, but like that can be unrelated. Like that's what I recognize with time. If you had taken me and sent me 6,000 miles, I'd just never been far. I grew up in like an Orthodox bubble in Long Island and then moved to go upstate to a school that was also populated with people from Long Island. You know what I'm saying? Like right. it's not... Like, that was my first time to get to just be me as I define myself. So I think it probably would have happened in Italy, too. You know, even talking about this with books now, you know, it's just so much, and so many of our problems here, and I'm talking about it there, is this idea, this crazy need to categorize everyone and put them in boxes. Like, it's, you know, I learned it my first book tour, like, flying around the country and seeing everything cut into squares. I always get excited when I hear about those, like, lizard bridges. I'm like, yes, yeah, some things can't do squares, you know. Help the turtles cross the street. But, you know, like, but I do think, you know, things, you know, like this idea. I don't have to look in the mirror. I understand looking at me, you probably all see a Jew. But I'm saying I can look in the mirror. I just want to see me. You know what I'm saying? Right. So these people who are obsessed, grown-ups who care about, like, some 15-year-old, which bathroom they're going to pee in in their high school in Tennessee, like, calm down, okay? This person doesn't have to fit a box for you. But even think about that with Israel novels. Like, this is not an Israel novel right. to me. My Argentine... My art, you know, like this book is mostly, there's more France in here and more Berlin, but I'm also interested in how we define that way. You know, like to use this year, like Joshua Cohen has a book, Nicole Cret, like Fo let's use Foer, like John, uh, we'll give all three names, Jonathan Safran Foer, like he had a big fat Israel book last year. I read that book. There's dirty parts. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm saying I read that book. That's a book about family and that's a book about marriage and divorce and the generations. And, you know, there's so many ideas in there. And yes, there's an Israel part, you know what I'm saying? So in this right. idea, like, I'm just obsessed with justice and injustice and gray space and where realities meet, but yeah, there's an Israel part. There, there had, you're coming out of orthodoxy to secular Jewish, it had to be a hard moment. I, I'm, I'm thinking about, and I mentioned Philip Roth before, but Philip Roth often talked about how hard it was to write certain parts of his reality because he knew that his family would react, his community would react a certain yeah. way. Have you had that situation where you said, yeah, you got to self-edit because people are going to get pissed off, you're going to offend yeah, somebody? Yeah, but... Uh uh, that's so funny. I was just about to say he's been so nice to me. I was going to be like Philip, but he, then I was like that. I always remember being in the audience and be like, "When Ray Carver and I, and I was like, I was like, calm down." Anyway, right. but nonetheless, but like I think that's that notion where you're asking this question about him, but he uses, I mean, literally, it's the writer's job to be aware. So you're saying he's aware of how things affect people, but I have never, I don't know anyone who more where you can have a conversation with him and then see it verbatim. You know what I'm saying? Like, he needs to be aware of that because he draws his, you know, I can't even imagine how many feet, you know, the Newark Library is getting out of, like, <laughs> diaries. You're getting his, actually, I don't know who has his papers. They're getting his books. But uh, right. But I'm saying, like, that's his job. I, I Back to being in a moral fiction, I feel like it's his job to think if you're going to draw that closely off your life. You know what I'm saying? You'll literally be, I remember seeing, you know, a woman, you know, when I was entering the writing world, it would be like, that's that character from that book, and it's so exciting to like piece the people that characters are based on from a writer's life, which you can do when you write that close. But right. there's another writer who I remember saying, like, who wrote things, and he was saying almost offhandedly, like, you know, that his book needed it, and like, who cares about the damage? You know, I'm changing the quote so much because I don't want to be identifiable, <laughs> but like, literally didn't care about. Yeah, I think you just need to know you know, who you're going to hurt. I, 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 don't, I do think the world's come together and you do have responsibilities, you know, in that way. But right. uh, yeah, you write. I, I know people who are like waiting for people to die to write. I sure. Th I think that matters. But for me, yeah, that's not a concern in the way I draw things. I don't, uh, I think about all that and I feel really comfortable with those choices and I'm not, I'm not the writer who's making the most radical choices of, you know, I don't use people's secrets that way. You know, does right. that make sense? Makes total sense. So we'll wait for someone to pass away before we read that number. Three, two, um, two. <laughs> toy, toy. From toy, toy. So uh, I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up yeah. to you to ask some questions. So I'm going to ask this one to let you think about it for a little while. But um, 
I, I, I want to go to a book that you wrote and you talked about right before, which is what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank. And there was this great story, this uh, great game that you play, you know, who would hide us? And I'm just wondering where this idea came from, where this game came from, if it's something that you really played and if you yeah. saw it. You know, tell us a little bit of history on that one. So back to getting, you know, what I was talking about, writing closer and, and feeling able to use my own life to be as vulnerable and raw and naked as I need to be while using stuff closer. And that's, you know, I didn't read that part tonight, but that's when this book was done. There's moments where I'm like, oh, I took something from my second grade or from my memory. Because, you know, when you talk about the spy in this book, I'll, I'll share the memory, which is like, you know, what's a spy doing? But I'm, I'm really interested in how realities get built. Like, that's it. National realities, like, because memory, it's, it's, it's all, you know, it's its own thread. So how national realities get built, how personal realities, and a spy is someone who has to live, to not die, a spy has to be able to live as someone else. And for a writer, it's like a non-spy, a cowardly spy in your room, but like it doesn't work unless I become these characters, you know? Like if I'm not them, if I can't fully be them, it's not going to be readable for you. It's not going to work. And then I thought about ideas of passing, and I really thought about my first shape-shifting was being like a religious kid you know, turning the corner when you're going to get an ass whooping, you know, like the anti-Semites are there, you're here, and you're turning. Literally the definition of passing, I want to pass them and not get beat up. And we don't go like this with our hand. We'd swipe our hands overhead, and your yarmulke would be gone, and you'd go from Jew to Gentile like that. And if you did it convincingly, you wouldn't have to fight. You know what I'm saying? Right. But yeah, so that idea, like for this book to be able to go that, like that literally is my memory that goes into this book, or my second grade shows up in this book. But it was, you know... If you have ticks, you have to learn them as a writer. I say, if everyone chortles when something's funny in your book, that's a tick. You can't have four books, and every time there's a laughter, someone chortles. Also, have no chortles. Right. Don't like the sound of that. But uh, but themes, yeah, you become aware, and I can see how each story, each piece leads up to it. And thank you. That's a great last question um, before we open it up, which is, it was for that last book where you, your life is normal to you. Like your homes are normal until you get to college, basically, if you didn't go to sleepaway camp. Like I'm saying, if you had beer for breakfast every day of your life, you get to the cafeteria in college, you crack open a beer in the morning, you pour it in a bowl on your Cheerios, and everyone's like, what are you doing? And you're like, having breakfast. And that's when you find out, like, there's a problem in your house, <laughs> you know? But, but my, not normal. my sister and I, like, it's just how we made order. We're... we're you know, we have this real, it interests me, we have real shtetl head, we're fifth generation Americans, but back to education, again, back to building realities. Because of the school I went, the community in which I live, like it's really weird to have synapses fire as if we're like first generation, you know, as if our parents were survivors. Right. Like that's bizarre, you know? So, but the game, we it's not even a game, just how we made shorthand. If you, any two people, like, you know, if we're, friends were you know, like new people about a couple we'd meet, you know, my sister and I would be like, just say like, yeah, he'd hide us and she'd drop a dime in a minute. We just always, <laughs> honestly, we wanted to know who would hide us and who would not. And I just thinking about it, I was like, oh, that's actually so disturbing and twisted. And I thought like, oh, that's probably makes for story. You know? Right. So, What's scary you know. is to think that maybe that we're raising, raising another generation that's still thinking that way again. I'm well, right. now we need to because now we, like, people have come up to me now that they say, like, they ask that question for real. Do you have a room here in California? Like, I say, they're tearing apart families. If DACA disappears, there's American children who are going to be torn from their families or deported or, like, are you going to, you know what I'm saying? It's not even a game. Like, back to not wanting history to be current. Like, you know, we are living things like that now as a human being are you going to protect someone in the you know same situation that you would want to be saved in? Like you know, you know. Right. So on that note, <laughs> let's open it up to you. I know that many of you have questions. You're big fans. Uh, we can go in any direction you want. He's quite nimble, as you've seen. Um, raise your hand. Ronit has the mic. We can keep going, otherwise. No, no. This is the traditional awkward moment for awkward me. Awkward moment for the first <laughs> right question. I, I cherish it. Yes. Mallory, Hi. stand up. Mallory, stand up. Oh. Do I have to? No one else is going to ask a question. <laughs> no one else has to stand up, up with Mallory. Oh, see? I don't want to scare anybody off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I was just wondering, your brain is working at such an insane pace, and I'm trying to follow, but have you <laughs> I heard always... the word insane. <laughs> <laughs> have you always had so many thoughts and ideas when you were a kid? Did you kind of come up with crazy stories? Was, is this something yeah. that 
was always a part of you, and what were you like as a small child? Right. <laughs> right. Like, uh, to repeat the question, she's like, did you have any friends at all? <laughs> That's the real question. Um, thank you. No. Um, yeah, well, you know, now you get to the shape of this book. I really, uh, I will not rate all your, we won't make you stand, and I won't rate all your questions, but I'll rate that one. Great question. But, um, uh, oh, yeah, so I really, so when I went to, Iowa, you know, I was 24 years old, which felt old, like back to when you really have a dream. I was like, there's somebody here, you know, there was like one person who was 22. I was like, I've missed my whole writing career. Anyway, right, right. but um, but I studied with Marilyn Robinson, who I mentioned probably every night because she so shaped me. But she's the one who taught me when I showed up there, which is, you know, both that back to that education and that yeshivish education that I was basically writing in Yiddish in English. You know, I'd say like, I should wait here all day for you to show up at 5.30 when we see, said we'd meet at three o'clock, that's a friend. You know, like, <laughs> and, and she taught me literally like, you know, what a teacher should do. Like, really, I owe her so much, but she was like, this is all the elements of a paragrapher in here, just put this, that, you know. So she taught me to unravel, but also you have to learn, like my head spins, my thoughts spin, and I was writing those spinning things, and a story, you know, it's A to B, whatever the shape of it. It's a linear thing, and to communicate as a writer, I wrote my books A to B, and it's really until this book, like back to these, you know, if you never know, and it's nice to see an audience like this tonight, like we're just, you know, two weeks in, but if a book goes right, some grad student will take it apart like a watchmaker, you know, with, you know, screwdrivers. There's literally like seven different timelines, but I thought you know, I thought I both have the muscles now to do it and for this conflict, like what has me pulling out my hair and breaks my heart, you know, put Gaza war in Wikipedia and you'll just see a list of them. They're cast lead, Operation this, Oper grapes, you know, Operation Grapes of Red. Like they have names, you know what I'm saying? It's not a movie, it's real. Like right now, Hamas is building rockets to fire it as well. They're doing their plan. Israel is planning what they're going to, they call it mowing the lawn, where they want to dial back those rockets, their targets, to do enough damage to hold it off till the next war. They're building a wall. There's a wall up at Gaza. They're building a wall underground now, which, by the way, as somebody who likes words, walls go up. I don't even know what you call a wall underground. There's no word for that. Anyway, but, you know, but this notion, it's the cycles of the cycles of buildup, violence, death, get some quiet, get a minute of peace, start building again. They're doing it again and again. So back to those circles in my head, I was like, oh, I'm finally allowed to let my circles loose. And I think I have the fictional muscles to control them. But yes, I always talk too fast and try and slow it, <laughs> and try and slow it down. Good question. Over. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Moldau, welcome here. Oh, we're going to come for drinks then. We're all coming yes, there. Exactly, a little bit of schnapps. <laughs> welcome here. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, uh, I was struck by the piece that you wrote in the New York Times after... Uh, Charlottesville. Charleston. Yeah. Thank you. Charlottesville, that's right. I thought it was a wonderful piece of writing. What struck me about it was not long before that, we had a bomb threat here in this building. And... Uh, our apartment looks out over the courtyard here, and uh, in the afternoon, after the alarm had been sounded, kids started coming out of the building here. Yeah, yeah. You know, from the day school. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were, you know, they're doing what kids were doing. They were yeah. bopping along behind their behind their counselors, and they didn't seem particularly alarmed. But uh, I was thinking about that that night, and thinking about your piece, and I wondered, what on earth should they be thinking? Well, so what this, should I be helping them to think? That's a uh, yeah, that's beautiful, and that's I mean I guess this is the point. Like I never and, and I'm just honored. Like what a weird job I have. You know I just I don't really write nonfiction, but you know I'm a parent now, and you know we're just living in the world. We're sitting like we're human. I just can't like I can't tell you. So this is the point. Like nobody forgets these things. So it makes me want to cry. What you're asking because those kids aren't going to forget that till the day they die. And I'm not giving this, you know, back to, it takes, back to the peace process, it took so many people to almost get peace that could have happened, and it takes a few people to burn the whole thing down. We have a wonderful country here that has been built over 200 years. It's taking just a few people to, we, do, we don't even have a democracy anymore. Like, we have a straight up kleptocracy. Like, it is shocking, you know, a white, openly white supremacist leadership. It is, you know, shocking to me. So yes, just back to writing that piece, I can't believe they, ran it with that nasty first line of mine, but like I just said, like this is all I can do, that's what I do, is speak up, but yeah, I, I don't know what to tell them except 
not to allow it. Because I, you know why I wrote that? Because I was thinking, you know, I know my father-in-law's from Montreal, you know, his story from 60, 50 something years ago about like his anti-Semitic story. My wife said to me, like, she's like, oh, I don't even, I've never had any anti-Semitism. I was like, except that you consistently, repeatedly tell the story of the teacher in Texas who said he was going to make a lampshade out of you in front of the class. And I was like, she's like, oh yeah. And I was like, we all forever. I remember every swastika. I rem and I was like, we're going to do this all again. We were done with that. And back to writing that piece. I look, I'm so proud of the generation. Like, my, you know, nephews, like the 20-somethings, like, you know, that's the example I use in the pieces. Being at a Nets game, like, we used to hide our yarmulke. So I just remember seeing a big mouth kid with a yarmulke just giving shit to, like, fans of the opposing. And I said, like, that is my proudest American stuff, like, friends who aren't afraid to be themselves. And, you know, to have a, it was one thing just to be and keep your yarmulke on. But to have a big mouth, you know what I'm saying? It was so beautiful to me. Like, I just think history moves you know, Israel's like more than 2,000 years this fight, so progress is to the edge and then we lose ground. And that's what happened in America. Like, I do think there is right and wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't understand our political accusations of flip flopping, that changing your mind is flip flopping. It's not a flip flop that Obama recognizes that everyone should be able to get married in this country. It's called evolution and it's called, you know, progressing. It's called, like, there's no position otherwise. You know, now we're the government's defending the cake people. So I'm just saying, I think we made a lot of progress, actual progress. Healthcare is progress. Like, we just, 9 million children lost their health care. There's no position. There's no, there's no Bible position for this. Because taking away, not having health care, maybe you can make something. To take health care from children, their children are going to die. Whoever did this, they just killed children. Okay, so I'm saying, yes, we are losing ground because I feel like we made progress. People don't like change. I hate change. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's scary. So, yes, I don't know what to tell them except don't accept it. You know, tell this member to grandkids, and I hope it's the same way that I thought I was going to say, oh, yeah, I used to have to fight the anti-Semites, you know. So, yeah, that's it. I will tell you, ironically, when we, uh, vi when we had to evacuate the building and the kids were the ones to go with us, it was the Moldau residents who were like, Feh, there's a show tonight. I want to get my seat. And they were the first ones to come in, and they were like, eh, it's just a Good. fake. We're not worried about not, it. Not being, <laughs> not being afraid is important. Yes, it is. Yeah, maybe we'll make this the last one so we don't. Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come, yeah. please. A literary question, cultural. Yes. Literary. Uh, books, uh, American Jewish books about Israel and Israeli Jewish books about America are few and far between. There yes. are very few of those. Yes. And apparently, I didn't read the book yet, but apparently your new book is, is about that. How do you see the cultural relationship between American Jews and Israeli Jews? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I kind of want you to answer that. I was going to say, <laughs> I can hear from your accent that you have some information too. But uh, yeah, well, how do I see the relationship between? So this is the. I can talk about that for two hours straight. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so I see that relation. I see that relationship as individual. Like one thing I liked. So back to the, in a global sense, back to framing. I think it's hard for people. Like it's like that idea when people get to they hear like. Israelis don't all get along. It's the Jewish state. I'm like, first of all, it's 20% Arab. Second of all, like, you know, I just like to explain, like, the bloods and the crips. Like, just Hasidim. They're like, yeah, there's Hasidim. And I'd be like, no, short socks is this, the hat tilted. You know, we used to know where we put our yarmulke in New York. I could tell you what yeshiva they went to. Like, MTA boys wore this. We wore it. You know, like, you know. So just that idea that th people think everything's monolithic and nothing is monolithic, which is what makes complications. So that's huge to me. But separately, I think there's that weird assumption, which we just, Dennis Ross just had a piece, this idea like only Jews, you know, everyone else can be loyal to two things or have a different identity. This weird notion, you know, I, I, I separate an Israeli, you know, it's not even anything. Judaism is a religion, you know. Israeli, it's a, it's a nationality, and it's a totally different thing. And I, I remember being, like, shocked there, you know, like, just that idea of things that I took for granted that are so not for granted, notions of intermarriage, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like somebody, like, that's, you know, just religious concepts, yes. It just can't be any more radically different, and I'm very careful to separate religion and nation and on and on and on into infinity. But personally, as I said, these are experiential things. Like, I'm not writing this as an American who spent two weeks there. Like, I lived there for almost seven years. Like, and that was how my whole head shape, my whole adult life. You know what I'm saying? When I came back, 
If you spend 19, 20 somewhere and a bunch of time till you're 20 something, and then you know from like you know 26 to 31 in a place, like my time of like having a credit card and being an adult was as an Israel. I can't tell you how many years. Fifth generation American, a New Yorker. I remember having a fight with a guy because he was Israeli, but he screamed, so he was on a moving truck and he like screamed to me something in Hebrew, like, what time is it or whatever? And I answered him and I was like, but I'm not Israeli. And then we got into this whole fight. You know, like I'd walk into a store and people would just start, for years it's finally stopped, but they would just start speaking to me in Hebrew. And that was really an interesting thing to me as a New Yorker in my hometown, in my old neighborhood. Why? Like, what about my facial musculature or my body or how I was moving? So, yeah, like it really, so for me to write about it, it's just an identity that I had that's like such a giant part of my life. And I do think that's, that's the part of it, but I, I think that's why. I think we can remove the Israeliness from the interest in the story. Like, I am interested in that conflict in this book, and you know, like outside of any of those other labels. Maybe we should stop there. Well, we have one last question. You got time for All one right. more, Nathan? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering how your parents accepted your secularism, and are they proud of your success? Yeah, uh, my my uh, yes, are my parents proud? That's the best. That's the easiest question to know. My father's passed away a while ago, but he lived. He saw the first two books. But uh, yes, they're happy. Um, that's the best part about Jewish parents. If there's success in anything, they'll be like, yeah. <laughs> Not such a bad guy. Now, uh, you know what? His brother's though, he's a doctor. Yeah, right, exactly. Awesome. But uh, no, I don't know. I have to say, like, yeah, I'm a big believer. I hate the word tolerance when people are like, let's have, let's tolerate each other. Like, you know, I don't want to tolerate, I don't want to be tolerated by you. To you tolerate me? I find tolerance really actually downright insulting. I'm not looking to be tolerated by anyone. I'd like to be respected. But yeah, I, you know, back to how memory works and has time things, I'm sure it was a shock at different times. A, uh, now that I'm a parent, and I'm sure there's plenty of parents in here, and, uh, as we say in poker, until you're pot committed, parents will fight for a lot of things until it's set. And then they're like, no, we're fine with it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you want your kids to stay on the West Coast? You're like, don't move to... Once they get the apartment in New York, you're like, all right, we're coming for five weeks. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I do think how memory works, like, you know, it's just all I know now is like, yeah, I'm sure it was, you know charged when it started, but it's like a, you know, it's exactly what I would want, which is just, you know, yeah, we're super loving and super respectful. And, you know, that's the notion. Like my, you know, my sister who's so religious is like really great about my life and, you know, makes adjustments for my life. And if she's not looking, I will not tray for a kitchen. Like that's not a joke. Like that's the point. You know what I'm saying? And I really think the difference between tolerance and respect, you know, goes, you know, back to the whole point of this book. Like, you know, empathy is all I'm after. So I'm going to end with one last question that I have for you, um, because you said something pretty deep when we were just chatting. I don't have that here. many closing hits. <laughs> right, to well, stick the landing. A third you time. said, uh, "I'm testing you." Yeah. Right? This is Silicon Valley. Yeah, exactly. The, the, um, you said I wrote this for you when you were downstairs and we were talking about the book, and you know, the, the book is the reading a book is an intimate experience, yes. and coming here to to meet the author is different when you're going to. Right, um, and you said I wrote it for you, which was I thought was such an interesting line, as opposed to you know, oh, I wrote it because I had to get it out. I wrote it because the story I had to tell. I wrote it for me, and you just happened to be enjoying it. You specifically said I wrote this for you. Yeah. When you write, is that what you think about, or is it the audience? Well, this is I always say like it's funny. You have to learn, and I can rem you know nobody forgets as a writer. Like I remember every time like where you get caught in a quest. You know, you can just say pass like a game show. It takes a writer a long time. I don't ever say that, but I'm I'm just saying lifeline. Like in terms of. Bad questions that authors get. I've seen so many authors answer it. I'd love to like see them lined up. They're so horrible where people get posed like, who are you? You know, I say I'm used to it. Part of launching a book, like I'm so thankful to be out here to talk to you all. Like part of it is like open any magazine now. It'll be like Nathan's five favorite summer salads. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like that's what I'm doing right now. There's like two more on press. Like I'll be, you know, like that's part of being out in, in the world. But that question of who you write for, I feel like it's, you know, I try and be cynical in life. You know, when I'm talking, you know, I like scream out a tragedy, I'll make a joke. But it's so vulnerable. The writing process is this out of body thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard to explain. But like when you talked about connecting to, I was like, that's our green room conversation. Like that's the point for me. It really is individual. And you meet the person and then it all, 
I really believe each read is individual. Back to your question, like how are, I get asked, how are Israelis going to respond? How are Americans going to respond? You know, I actually, that's funny. I already mentioned Jeff. Jeff is uh, you talk about him on the road endlessly. He's much taller than me. And I use him city to city. I say, like, I'm 5'7", he's 6'7". We have a one-foot difference. And I always say, when I describe someone as tall in my book, I mean 5'9". And then I say, <laughs> when my friend reads it, he thinks 6'9". You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what it is to bring yourself to a book. And when you talked about your experience, I hear, like, head of APAC, all this stuff. I'm like, I wrote it for you. I wrote it for the BDS, like, Palestinian activist. I wrote it, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it's not a specific reader. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's only after the fact, but it is about that point of connection, as I said, about sharing a consciousness. But more when I say to you is I like exciting reads to me or people who come to it, you know, uh, you know, I was going to say loaded, but like fuck gun metaphors today. Right. So I'm just saying, you know, people who come to it with real positions, real expertise, like you're both, you know, when I say you, I was like, I like a terrifying reader. Like, you're a terrifying reader for me. Like, you're coming immobile. You know, I, the example, that's what I'll end with is, but I remember I always attribute it to the Baltimore Rebbe. But, you know, I don't know why. Probably not true for him, but that's how I remember it from 100, 100 years ago. But he said, like, he was in a fight with his brother with a book he wrote, and he said, my brother, it's a terrible book, and I'm never going to read it. You know what I'm saying? And when I talk <laughs> about, like, preconceived notions, like, I've never written anything that scares me more where, where pretty much everyone coming to it is going to bring a, you know, inviolable, immobile position where this is not funny, not to be toyed with. I'm not moving. I don't see the other side. You know, like that's, and I'm not saying other, I have more empathy. I'm saying, or they do see the other, I'm just saying, what, whether you're extreme empathy or extremely flexible, or it's just going to be extreme. And that, that's the point of this book. And you, sir, are an extreme reader <laughs> in terms of background for this book. Well, you nailed it for me and I think everyone in this room. So thank you oh, thank for writing you. Thank you. and being here. Thank really you so much. Nathan, thank you. It's great. Um. Thank you, Nathan Englander and Zach Bodner.